The New Zealand cult Gloria Vale was founded by a man named Hopeful Christian, yet there was nothing hopeful about his actions whatsoever. This community has hidden child abuse, sexual assault, exploitation, and a lot more. Some argue that they're one big happy family and deserve to be left alone. But do close-knit communities really deserve privacy if it's at the expense of children's well-being? So hello everyone and welcome back. Today, we've got another cult lined up to talk about. However, unlike a few of the other cults we've discussed in previous episodes, this one is actually still around with hundreds of active members. It almost goes without saying, but I'm going to put a trigger warning right here that if you're sensitive to the topic of cults, sexual abuse, child abuse, and things of that nature, then today's episode will not be the one for you. For those of you still here though, we're going to be talking about the Gloria Vale Christian community, otherwise known as Cooperites, named after their founder, Neville Cooper. The Gloria Vale community is currently based in Halperi Valley on New Zealand's South Island West Coast. Before we get into the many, many problems with this supposed community, let's talk about their history and beliefs this place was built on. Neville Cooper actually named himself Hopeful Christian after he moved from Australia to New Zealand in 1967. By 1969, he set up the Gloria Vale community named after his first wife, Gloria. And that's where the story starts in most of my sources because naturally, this is where the controversy begins. The most information that I could really unearth about his past was that Neville Cooper was a traveling preacher before he settled down. There is one little bit of information on Gloria Vale's own website where it reads the following. In 1967, the Queensland newspapers proclaimed a miracle had happened when a light plane crashed with four people on board and everyone survived. The plane was piloted by the founder of the Gloria Vale Christian community while he was returning from mission work in North Queensland. It seems that this 1967 event may have given Cooper the idea that he was chosen for a higher calling. This may have been the catalyst for Gloria Vale and for his justification for his later horrific actions. As an aside here, I'm going to call Cooper hopeful Christian as little as possible. As we'll see later, his acts do not bring nor inspire hope. So if you do hear him called hopeful Christian, it's a quote and I'll be referring to him as Cooper. Moving on. After traveling as a preacher, Cooper fell out of favor with mainstream teachings. He leaned towards a more fundamental approach. Fundamentalism, if you aren't aware, means having a very strict literal interpretation of things. For example, women had to cover their heads, show no flesh, submit to their husbands, and have as many children as possible. According to Lilia Tarara, the granddaughter of Cooper, we were taught to sacrifice one's self-will and serve the church was the only way to salvation. There was a godly order established in the church. The highest power was God and then church leaders. Husbands were to submit to the church and wives must submit to their husbands. Children came last and were expected to obey their parents who served the Lord. Some leaders not only encouraged violent beatings, but scolded parents who were lenient. This was a church that preached nonviolence and anti-war, yet it saw fit to punish their young for minor errors. The leaders defended their philosophy based on the scripture, spare the rod and spoil the child. Some men took this literally using weapons like polystyrene pipes to beat their sons. Certain other members rebelled against the impositions and refused to treat their children badly. And I witnessed loving relationships between many parents and their children. A wife would, in strict confidence, show me her young children who had horrific marks on their legs, bottoms, and backs where her husband had beaten them. The womb of an ungodly woman was taught to be the most dangerous place in the world. Women were considered subordinate and children's views mattered the least. On one occasion, when Lilia received a school report that praised her leadership qualities, her grandfather read it aloud and mocked her, saying that he didn't want bossy women like her at Gloria Vale. Some former members say that sex was talked about at every meal and the cult was quote, a competition as to who could pump out the most kids. Linda Fury, a single mother of two was taken in by the community lifestyle and joined Gloria Vale in 1975. According to her, cult members even partake in incest. Daughters were expected to bathe with their fathers. Children were encouraged to watch their parents sleep together and women weren't permitted to refuse their husband's demands for sex. Cooper's own actions were especially disturbing. Not only would he teach young girls to pleasure themselves in his bed, but he'd physically handle brides on their wedding night. Fury's own son ran away from Gloria Vale, but eventually returned. It wasn't until his own escape until 1983 that he completely cut all ties with her. 
Miss Fury claimed that leaders had filled his mind with negative thoughts about his mother. Years later, she learned that her son had been gang raped by several men at the age of 13. Looking back, Miss Fury, now 79 and living on the North Island, said joining the commune was a stupid mistake that destroyed her family. Despite these beliefs, the community grew. In the 1980s, the group known as the Cooperites outgrew the Christchurch premises and moved to farmland in remote Hyperi, 65 kilometers east of Greymouth. One 2017 article states that the closed community has between 550 to 600 members, made up of 55 families with an average of eight children each. The church itself is run by the charity Christian Church Community Trust. In order to be a charitable entity in New Zealand, an organization must benefit a charitable cause. In this case, their cause is supposedly advancing religion and benefiting the community. It's important to recognize that, like with plenty of cults, they didn't start out with nothing. The people, or leaders at least, are living large. They have $10 million worth of farmland and twice as much value in buildings, vehicles, and equipment. All Gloria Vale members live and work at the property for the community and any income received is eventually donated to the trust. This isn't just a cult, but a moneymaker for those in charge. Weekly living expenses are calculated at just under $40 per person. No wonder it's been so difficult for many to leave. For some like Lilia, it's like they've all they've ever known. And from the sound of it from this article, the church and Gloria Vale can become their entire lives. It's their job, they live there, and those are their friends. It's how they get their necessities. They're dependent on this cult. And I think that's something to realize, something that's important to notate as we, for the most part, are people looking in, at least I'm someone who is looking in. Because from the outside, from my perspective, I know I've wondered countless times when researching these things and my team's been researching these things, it's why don't these people just leave? Why don't they just go? And I think it's really important to recognize the power dynamic that's at play within them here and see how reliant these people are on the cult for day-to-day life. This isn't as simple as just, oh honey, I'm going to the cult Monday to Friday and then I'll be home on the weekends. It involves and absorbs your entire way of life. Anyway though, for a while, Gloria Vale and Cooper seemed to fly under the radar and not much was known about them, or at least not much was reported. However, in the mid 1990s, that's when things started to change. Now, this is going to become the part of the episode where things are gonna start going downhill. So I'm going to place the sponsor here. This is your last warning that things are about to get really, really terrible because after the sponsor break, that's it, I've warned you. So here's the sponsors. And if you're back after this break, buckle up. Ah yes, the holiday season is finally here. The celebrations with friends and family, the shopping, the decorations, the going to work all day through it all. It's a busy time right now for a lot of us. But I never have to worry about whether my freezer is stocked because Daily Harvest has my back with delicious, easy to make food that's actually good for me. Daily Harvest delivers delicious harvest bowls, flatbreads, smoothies, and even treats all built on organic fruits and veggies right to you. And it stays fresh in your freezer until you're ready to eat it. I think many of you know that I am in fact a smoothie fiend and Daily Harvest's smoothies has been able to quench my appetite and they always are coming out with new flavors and just new things to try. Like just recently, they released the spice pear and cranberry smoothie and you bet your bottom dollar, I will get my hands on that and try it because that sounds so festive, so delicious and it's a smoothie, so of course. If you also want to try Daily Harvest, make sure you go to dailyharvest.com casket to get up to $40 off your first box. That's dailyharvest.com casket for up to $40 off your first box. dailyharvest.com casket. Don't you love the feeling when you find the perfect piece of clothing that fits you, your style, and what you need it for? Well, that's what it feels like to use Stitch Fix Freestyle. Stitch Fix Freestyle is your trusted style destination where you can shop items curated to your styles, likes, and lifestyle. Whether you're looking for a brand you already love or hoping to try something new, Stitch Fix Freestyle gives you the chance to try over 1,000 brands personalized to your fit and your style. Now, when I usually talk about Stitch Fix, I usually talk about that they are the people who keep my sweater addiction alive and well, but they're also the company that got me hooked on my new favorite brand of jeans. They're called Democracy Jeans, and they are so comfy, so stretchy, they fit just right, like I'm in love. And I would have never even known about the brand, let alone tried them, if not for Stitch Fix, and I'm so grateful that I did. Plus, they make the clothing shopping hunt just a little bit easier because they've got free shipping, returns, and exchanges, and you don't even need a subscription to use it. So get started today by filling out your style quiz at stitchfix.com slash casket. That's stitchfix.com slash casket to try Stitch Fix Freestyle. stitchfix.com slash casket. (laughs) 
sexual abuse allegations were made against Cooper in the mid 1990s. And in 1994, Melanie Reed worked undercover in the Cooperite community to try to get to the bottom of this. Melanie has stated recently, I have done hundreds of television stories in the past two decades, but this story more than any others has followed me. Hardly a week goes by when someone doesn't say to me, oh yeah, you're the journalist who wore that blue dress and headscarf and went undercover into Gloria Vale. Melanie adds that she interviewed a woman who left after being sexually abused by Cooper. It wasn't just the abuse that was harrowing. She, along with many other Cooperite defectors were struggling to adapt to the outside world. Some children that left the community weren't informed when their parents died until she'd already been buried, for example. One such defector, Michael, was so severely impacted by the death of his mother and the accusations of indecent assault against his father, Cooper, that he took his own life. At the time, Melanie says that she was told by one of Michael's brothers that, quote, dad wouldn't care. He expected it to happen since Michael left the community. The event took place during Melanie's investigation and made her all the more determined to infiltrate the community. She learned how to milk cows and told the Cooperite community she was an agricultural student wanting work experience. And every night at dinner, she sat with Cooper and listened to him talk on and on about the merits of his community and God. Of course, at this time, Melanie wasn't the only one who had her eyes on Gloria Vale. The courts did too. Cooper was put on trial in the mid 1990s for multiple counts of sexual assault. And the evidence against him was alarming. One woman testified that she'd been penetrated with a wooden object, but Cooper claimed that she was given said object and encouraged to use it on herself as therapy. Other former members said that arranged marriages were decided by Cooper who believed girls were ready for marriage and sex and having children the moment they began their menstrual cycle. Lelia Tarawa herself had stated, he would happily marry off children of 10 or 12 years if the law permitted it. It was only the New Zealand law that stopped marriages before the age of 16 that interfered with him. According to one source, Hopeful Christian was sentenced to six years prison on 11 charges of indecent assault in 1994, but the Court of Appeal squashed the sentences and his convictions and ordered a new trial. He was found guilty on three charges of sexual abuse on young community members at his second trial in December, 1995. He was sentenced to five years, but only served 11 months less than one year. Lilia has also said Gloria Vale's men are actually groomed to have sex with underage girls and shouldn't shoulder the blame because they are brainwashed into believing it's okay. Another former member, Karen Winder, takes an entirely separate view. Karen believes underage sex is not rampant and it only occurs within isolated cases. These children are growing up in an environment where sex is celebrated. The leader thinks that 13 or 14 year old girls are ready to have babies. There's no child rape going on, she said. A 23 year old is not necessarily totally culpable for his actions because he's been groomed for it. Cooper's son, Phil Cooper, said that he even had been sexually abused by his dad when he was a teenager. And former member Yvette Olson said that Cooper sexually assaulted her on multiple occasions when she was 19 years old. Many in the community don't see this as a problem and some don't even realize it's happening. Most of the families living in Gloria Vale believe Cooper was jailed for preaching the gospel, not for sexual abuse. Although Gloria Vale has been around for a while, a lot of stories about the community haven't emerged until just recently. This may be because Cooper himself didn't retire until 2010, allowing members the confidence to speak out and make their voices heard to outsiders. Media reports increased around this time, leading to a charity services investigation of the Christian Church Community Trust, the governing body of Gloria Vale. Police began regularly visiting the community as well. A multi-agency approach to safety within the community has been adopted at Gloria Vale and regular visits are made to the community by police and also in a multi-agency led approach, which includes Orange Tamariki, District Health Board and the Ministry of Education. West Coast Area Commander Inspector Mel Aitken said, A summary of charity services report can be found online. And yet, despite the multitude of evidence, their reaction was lackluster to say the least. One New Zealand source reads, Charity Services has determined that the most appropriate outcome for the current investigation is for Charity Services to continue to engage with the trust and assist them in implementing policies that will improve the governance and management of the trust. From there, Charity Services listed 18 actions that the trust needed to remain compliant and continue to enjoy their tax-free exemption as a charity. One of these was to not force members into an isolated hut as punishment. The fact that charity services felt the need to say, hey, please don't lock a 14 year old girl into a hut for a month because she had a relationship with a boy. Like, I don't know, that's not very charitable. Like maybe they shouldn't be one, but I don't know. And for the record, that actually happened. Other recommendations include that they have regular trust board meetings and that policies that only existed verbally need to be written down. 
Another policy which will come into play later was that defectors will be permitted to visit the community and that, quote, smacking of children is not permitted, end quote. The fact that this needs to be said again is ridiculous. But eyes were on Gloria Vale now, at least. Documentaries came out about them, although many have been criticized for being far too soft on the community, portraying the cult as an oddity or fictional, as opposed to the dark reality that was founded by a sex criminal. One such review from Melissa Harrison, who family was mistreated by the cult stated, the rhetoric that people are happy is tiring. Yes, there are good people in Gloria Vale. Yes, we could all use less consumer capitalism in our lives. And yes, living out our days with more cooperation would make for a better society. But Gloria Vale is not the prototype for that. The members have been stripped of their choice and their will, and I struggle to believe true and meaningful happiness exists devoid of these. There can be no reasonable doubt that these people, the women in particular, are subjugated. Sentiments that suggest otherwise are naive. The documentary that TVNZ did release became incredibly popular, and the director of the Gloria Vale documentaries, Amanda Evans, said that she didn't give them irresponsibly soft treatment and made it a point to mention that Cooper's offense was 30 years ago. And she says that the dynamic community shouldn't be forever defined by that event. Amanda also adds, "'I doubt attacking me personally will make Melissa Harrison any happier or change her understandably negative experience at Gloria Vale. What she feels is absolutely valid, deeply painful, and is her reality, so I am not going to negate her experiences or views by bagging her in a public forum. By the same token, Dove Love, a member of Gloria Vale, is genuinely happy, fulfilled young woman, and no amount of personal vitriol being reprinted by the Herald as a headline-grabbing opinion piece is going to change that. It's a different reality, but it's just as valid. Dove's story resonates with me and with many viewers because it shows us all that it's possible to make a happy life out of whatever cards you're dealt. It's necessary, however, to stop succumbing to negativity and get on with it. Now, the problem isn't that this was a loving, happy community with a leader who once committed a crime 30 years ago. The leadership itself abused children. Bringing awareness to this isn't succumbing to negativity. Cooper's view was that kids as young as 10 or 12 could be getting married and having babies if not for New Zealand's law. And by the way, that's confirmed by his own granddaughter's account. Not to mention, if Dove Love supposedly is so happy, then how come her brother has spoken out, claiming his sister never actually wanted to be married, but the leaders made her? How come a cult observer has spoken up and said Gloria Vale literally looks like The Handmaid's Tale, a dystopian nightmare come to life, except they wear blue and not red? The fact that Gloria Vale's own website promoted the documentary by NZTV about them speaks volumes. Still, Amanda said that the people there shouldn't be defined by one mistake their founder made. So then what about the other leaders? What about the other men in the Gloria Vale community? Was it really just one incident of isolated sexual abuse about 30 years ago? What else has Gloria Vale been hiding? Though Cooper was the leader, it's not just Cooper that was abusive either. Even if men were brainwashed in this environment to abuse their wives and children, accountability and justice still needs to be had for the victims. And that's exactly what needed to happen to Clem Reddy. According to one New Zealand source, Clem was continually assaulting his children, Prayer and Connie, when they were five to 17 years old. Connie stated that when he came home from work annoyed, his father would grab anything, a belt, a coat hanger, or a tool from his work bag to beat his children. While objectively he was hurting them, he believed he was doing them good. Unfortunately, it gets far worse than beatings, my source adds. Prayer Reddy, who had Down syndrome, died in Gloria Vale when she was 14. She choked to death on a piece of meat while in an isolation room where the door handles were disabled. She was the youngest of Clem and Sharon Reddy's 13 children. Her death was the focus of a stuff circuit investigation in 2016. Eight of the children are still inside Gloria Vale. I feel the need to point out that one of the 18 conditions of the investigation were no more isolation rooms or huts used for punishment. Prayer should have never been locked away in the first place. The risk of choking with Down syndrome is also slightly larger as dysphagia or difficulty swallowing is far more common a risk. One source states that research shows as many as 50% of kids with Down syndrome have dysphagia, while one study says that about 57% of children in their study were diagnosed with perennial dysphagia. It's possible Prayer never showed signs of dysphagia before, but personally, I feel that this death is due to negligence and mistreatment more than it was an accident. As for his punishment, in May, 2018, Clem Reddy was sentenced to one year's supervision and ordered to pay Connie $1,000 in emotional harm reparation. And by the way, that's one year's supervision, not even jail time, after his daughter had died at his hands. This isn't the only instance of the Reddy family having massive problems with the law, however. 
John Reddy, one of the older brothers of Connie and Prayer, was fired from his job on the Gloria Vale farm in 2017 when he was found with a book that had been left by a former member. Some of these former members are known as night raiders as they sneak into the community at night and leave books and pamphlets that question the leader's teachings, seemingly in the hope that current members will find it, like John. He left the community and got a job at the Rotomanu farm, but his wife believed if she left her children, they would be destined for hell. Reddy continued the battle with the help of lawyers to access to his nine children who remained in Gloria Vale. He got a house of his own and had regular visits from his children. He also continued a relationship with his wife and their 10th baby was born last year. But his wife was still not prepared to leave the community because she believes in the leader's teachings that if both parents leave, them along with all their children are doomed and would not be accepted into heaven. It's really amazing how psychologically trapped people are. Young people who leave, it destroys them. The treatment, the lack of support, it's a miracle they survive, Reddy said. Reddy's eldest teenage daughter was excommunicated for allegedly being a normal teenager, and Reddy has stayed close by to still have a relationship with his wife and family. He stood up to the leaders, and as of February, 2021, John filed a lawsuit in which he wants the court to remove the board of the trustees of the Christian Church Community Trust. In other words, they're not a charity, they shouldn't be seen as one. And John was willing to confront the court to say as much. As he says, it's not about destroying Gloria Vale, it's not about revenge, but it's about the safety of the people, especially the young kids that are being victimized there. Charity services as recently as September, 2020 have said that the allegations aren't oppressive enough for it to reinvestigate Gloria Vale. And they've refused to act even when 35 recent ex-members have sent out and signaled a letter alleging physical, emotional, and spiritual abuse. Sick children are left alone because parents have to work. There's no private space for families and there's pressure for members to lie to agencies such as Aranja Tamariki, New Zealand's child welfare services, and the police. Hopefully John's lawsuit against them will at least have some effect though. I suppose we will unfortunately have to wait and see. Police are still investigating yet more claims of child sexual abuse. And so the community is undoubtedly feeling some pressure. But here's someone we haven't spoke about in a hot minute. Where's Cooper in all of this? Well, Cooper passed away of a heart attack in mid 2018. Now, personally, I can really identify with David Reddy's reaction to the news because he said this, Right now, hopeful Christian will be standing in front of God and he's giving his account of everything he's done. I would like to say to him, I hope it was worth it. Unfortunately, we are still not done here. Even though it couldn't be more obvious that this place is a horrific abusive cult, we've still got more to discuss. And that's going to be thanks to Mr. Standfast. And don't get him confused with Steadfast because he's someone entirely different that we're also going to mention in just a bit. In March, 2019, a Gloria Vale teacher named Just Standfast was sentenced to six months community detention for indecently assaulting a nine-year-old girl by repeatedly kissing her and exposing himself on a bed during a playtime break. In court, he was supported by a Gloria Vale leader and served his sentence in a farmhouse owned by Gloria Vale. An article about the topic read, at sentencing in March, Judge Raul Neve said prison would be difficult for the man because of his age and physical limitations. Standfast lost one leg above the knee and has no elbow joint in another arm from a serious car accident in his 20s. The judge described the offending as a significant degree of abuse of trust as both the victim's school teacher and a trusted family friend and a person of obvious respect in your community. The victim at the time was age nine and was a pupil in the school at which you taught. And during 2012, you were her classroom teacher. I'm not going to go into extremely graphic detail here, but to summarize, the nine-year-old was a favorite student of his and during a playtime break, he was going to nap. Standfast was sleeping in a room adjacent to the classroom and told the nine-year-old to wake him. When she went to the room to do so, he kissed her hard, groped her bottom and exposed himself to her. As the judge continues, the girl left and told her mother what had happened. The next day, Standfast apologized to the girl's father and confessed to Gloria Vale leaders. He said the victim was vulnerable and the offending had caused her significant harm psychologically, he said. There has been a lot of confused feelings and conflicting emotions, in part, no doubt, because of the environment in which you were all living. Standfast wrote that he had no intention of exposing his genitals and Judge Neve in turn said that he was, quote, no real risk to the community, end quote. This is the same judge that handled the Clem Reddy case unsurprisingly. Whether or not the exposing himself was intentional, the kisses and groping absolutely were. So why didn't that warrant him registering as a sex offender? The fact that the judge even says that the environment played a factor here should be a massive red flag to anyone trying to justify this cult. 
The trust board was also earning about $20 million a year around this time too. Fervent Steadfast is the treasurer and Howard Temple was the overseeing Shepard's appointed successor, AKA the man who taken over with Cooper being gone. This new leader, Howard Temple, was investigated in 2020 for assaulting a 37 year old woman who was there in the community visiting her mother. Despite Howard admitting that he used force against her, police are not charging. One source stated, police documents show the woman told police that Temple grabbed her around the back of the neck and shoulders. In the ensuing struggle, her head hit the ground and while she was on the ground, a Gloria Vale woman pulled her hair so hard her eyes watered. Police claim this force, while technically an assault, was reasonable and justified to prevent the woman from trespassing. The woman had actually grown up in Gloria Vale, by the way. She married and had children there, only leaving in late 2019. She believed family members were permitted to visit since that was one of the requirements that charity services put out for Gloria Vale to remain tax exempt in their 33 page investigation in 2017. Therefore, it doesn't make sense that this woman who was there to visit that her mother would be assaulted for trespassing. She had a right to be there. Howard Temple wasn't the only one investigated recently either. Although there isn't quite as much information released on this case, another 2020 source reads the following. A 20 year old man has been charged with doing an indecent act on three children at the Gloria Vale Christian community. They were granted bail after appearing in the Greymouth District Court and are facing three charges of doing an indecent act on boys between the ages of 12 and 16. The charges are representative, meaning multiple offenses of the same type are alleged to have been committed in similar circumstances over a period of time. One charge relates to a 14 year old boy between May 1st and September 30th, 2018. He is alleged to have done an indecent act on another 14 year old boy between June 1st, 2015 and June 1st, 2016. He is also alleged to have offended against a 13 year old boy between January 1st and January 14th, 2015. Judge David Saunders granted the man name suppression until his next court appearance. Now, as far as I can tell, inquiries are still in the works and the investigation is continuing. More recent sources still haven't released his name or any details, however. By the time this episode is released, there might be more information out there, but for right now, I haven't found anything. I want to believe that the investigation will actually yield some real punishment. However, given what we've seen this far, I don't really give it a lot of hope. Overall, while I obviously have a massive issue with the leadership and child abusers in this community, I agree with John Reddy and others that say bringing these people to justice shouldn't be about revenge, or at least not just revenge, but the hundreds of people and children that are still in danger. Lilia, Cooper's granddaughter, has been incredibly outspoken about her experience, not only writing a book about her experience, but also hosting a TED talk in 2017. It has over 11 million views as of writing this, and by the way, it is an excellent watch. It it is absolutely excellent to hear from her. The content is not great. It is obviously disturbing, but it is really, really, really worth a watch. I highly recommend it because while Lilia talks about the obvious negative, she discusses the positives that lure people in too. How beautiful the area is, what she learned, and how much like a family the cult operates. She says that when she was 12, she felt like she could finally fulfill her purpose in life because she had her period. And by 14, she was confident she'd marry a boy named Willing, the son of Fervent, a church leader. One day, she says, she watched Fervent dragging Willing by the shoulder because he'd been disobedient. Willing was ordered to bend over and pull down his pants, beaten in front of the class with a leather belt. She knew that even though they were taught about love and God, that what she witnessed wasn't love. Jubilant, the class clown, was kicked and beaten by a teacher, but the teacher received no dismissal or reprimand. She also talks about her friend Grace, who was held in a room and made to confess that she was evil because she wanted to leave. I highly recommend, again, listening to this if you wanna hear about some of the inner workings of Gloria Vale for yourself. It will obviously be linked in my sources. Now, Gloria Vale still exists to this day, and that's what's got me worried a little more than anything. In 2020, the police stepped in because of allegations of workplace abuse, where Gloria Vale members had claimed to be threatened into working 20 hour work shifts. Exploitation is simply the cherry on top of the issues here with Gloria Vale. And of course, the workers at Gloria Vale aren't there for money, but for housing and food. All money earned goes pooled. Among everything else, Gloria Vale didn't abide by the lockdown rules of COVID-19 either. So police took that seriously and followed up with the community, working with them to be sure they followed lockdown restrictions. Apparently police will ensure that they follow restrictions during a pandemic, but neglect to properly handle the allegations of child abuse. The idea of the judge handling these cases being corrupt and paid off has floated around in my research. And a part of me wants to believe that because I don't wanna think that anyone could be this callous and care so little about justice, but I don't really know what was going on in that judge's mind. With all of that being said though, that's where I'm going to end today's episode. 
I wish I had better news. And I wish I could say they were shut down and disbanded and, and all sorts of these things. But for right now, it seems the best we can do is spread awareness about this horrible place and hope that the investigations actually go somewhere for once. So thank you all for tuning in to this episode. Please make sure to like, subscribe, follow whatever platform you're listening to so that you can stay up to date on all the recent episodes. If you wanna connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure to go to my Linktree link. It's gonna list all of my social media and other projects that I'm involved in. And if you're so inclined or interested in extra episodes, a more private community, hangouts, watching movies together, all that fun stuff, I do have a Patreon with a private Discord server along with many other perks and benefits. So if you wanna check that out, again, links are in the description. Thank you so much for making it to today's episode. I appreciate you being here and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.